The year was 1988. I was five years old and my parents went to go see some movie called Beetlejuice. Later, I asked them if it was a movie that I could watch, and the answer was a definitive no, stating that it was a quote, grown-up movie. I didn't get what the big deal was. It was just about drinking juice made out of bugs, right? What's so grown-up about that? Part of this nutritious breakfast. A year or so later, a cartoon with the same title as that grown-up movie started on Saturday mornings, and again, I was confused. This is about a girl and her weird ghost friend. How could the movie be for grown-ups if they made a cartoon out of it? And then, in high school, at the height of my stereotypical early 2000s Hot Topic teen Tim Burton obsession, I finally got around to watching the film, and, well, I figured out what my parents were talking about. And since then, I have wondered, why did they make a cartoon out of this? Hi, I'm Jenna from Neo Trash Video's Saturday Morning Edition, and this is They Made a Cartoon Out of What? Today's episode... Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice! Go ahead, Barbara, say it. Beetlejuice! It's showtime. Beetlejuice was a 1988 film starring Gina Davis, Alec Baldwin, Winona Ryder, Catherine O'Hara, Jeffrey Jones, and of course, Michael Keaton as the titular Beetlejuice. It was the second film Tim Burton directed after his major motion picture debut of Pee-wee's Big Adventure three years before. Where Pee-wee was bright, colorful, and whimsical, Beetlejuice set the precedent for the gothic tone and style that would be Burton's signature for, like, you know, the rest of time. It's just too creepy. Beetlejuice is about loving married couple Barbara and Adam Maitland, who suddenly find themselves one of the living impaired after accidentally driving their car off a bridge. You know what? I don't think we survived the crash. They find themselves trapped as spirits inside their house, which is then purchased by the Dietz family. Charles, a real estate developer on the brink of a nervous breakdown, who decided to move his family out to the country for a little relaxation and peace and quiet. Ten minutes. I'm already perfectly at ease. His high-strung wife, Delia, a sculptor who is obsessed with status and disgusted with the provincial quaintness of their new town. Don't you dare speak to others about me. The only thing that scares me is being embarrassed in front of the few hip people I can get to set foot in this part of Connecticut. So let's play family just for tonight. Hmm? And Lydia, a baby goth photographer who wallows in the dark and morbid. Live people ignore the strange and unusual. I myself am strange and unusual. When all of the Maitland's haunting attempts to scare the Dietzes out of their house fails, would you scram? <laughs> they are contacted by Beetlejuice, a quote bio-exorcist who promises to remove their pesky living person infestation once and for all. So, say it once, say it twice, third time the charm, and remember, I'll eat anything you want me to eat, I'll swallow anything you want me to swallow. Come on down now! Chew on the dog! And then, well, weirdness ensues. Beetlejuice was a lot of things. Darkly funny, satirical, visually innovative, but child-friendly it was not. Nice fucking model! With protagonist's death within the first eight minutes exactly of the film, jokes about suicide and pointless bureaucracy. You know what they say about people who commit suicide? In the afterlife, they become civil servants. And I'll tell you something. If I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have had my little accident. Some really disturbing visuals. <laughs> sexual humor, and an undead pervert trying to force a 15-year-old girl into marrying him, it's a pretty mature ride. Don't get me wrong, it's an awesome movie, and quite possibly my second favorite Burton film, but it is definitely not something I'd look at and go, you know what I think we should do? Market this to seven-year-olds. Yet yeah, market it to seven-year-olds, they did. Also, can we talk about the opening of the movie for a second? He carefully and lovingly picks up this wolf spider, and then just throws it out an attic window? Dick move, Alec Baldwin. Oh, by the way, those two are definitely dead. In the late 80s and early 90s, everything was a toy. And I do mean everything. And Beetlejuice was no exception. In 1989, Kenner Toys released a series of action figures based off of the film, with some questionable advertising choices. First, a double team! <laughs> Toys based off the movie also included a magic trick in the form of the vanishing vault, a talking doll with head-spinning action, a gross-out meter, and some pretty cool looking vehicles that were not at all in the film. There's also an NES game which was produced in 1991 by Rare Games. It's not great. But the biggest, hey, let's totally get kids into this franchise move was, of course, the animated series. It's showtime! The series was produced by Tim Burton himself with music by Danny Elfman, so a lot of the feel of the film made it into the cartoon. However, outside of that, it's almost entirely different concept. Between the movie and the cartoon, there are characters missing, characters added, and characters with totally different looks and personalities from the film. 
Poor Barb and Adam Maitland are nowhere to be seen, nor even mentioned. Lydia's dad, Charles, is pretty much the same, though his razor-edged nerves are played up a bit more. Lydia's stepmother, Delia, is almost an entirely different person. Where film Delia was sarcastic, condescending, short-tempered, and had an underlying darkness that created frightening torture device-looking sculptures, cartoon Delia is the total opposite. She is incredibly cheerful, almost to a manic level, covering the house in bright colors and flowers, almost as if the small-time life drove her absolutely mad. If you don't let me gut out this house and make it my own, I will go insane and I will take you with me! Lydia's character change is a little less severe, but while she maintains her goth aesthetic, she is a much happier, optimistic character than the teenage, angst-driven, overdramatic girl in the film. I am utterly alone. It's an honor to meet you, Mr. Poe. I've read all your books a hundred thousand times, and I'm a member of the Edgar Allan Poe fan club! Her classmates and parents still don't get her, and that causes some of the central conflict in many episodes, but for the most part, she's just like any normal girl. Just one who shops at Hot Topic versus Abercrombie. Is Abercrombie still a place where preppy kids shop? How out of touch am I here? Beetlejuice, however, has the most dramatic change. In the movie, he's an obscene and disgusting character, who is so unsavory that even the other ghosts advise the maintenance to stay away from him. Don't even say his name. He also, you know, tortures Lydia's family and tries to force her into marrying him. In the cartoon, he keeps a bit of his trickster elements, but it's toned down to something that's much more goofy and naive, and he's basically just one giant walking visual pun machine. I'm fit as a fiddle, strong as an ox. Mm, I get a kick out of life. Um, I get your drift, Beetlejuice. He's still super gross, but more along the lines of picks his boogers and throws them at people versus would totally rub his junk against you on a crowded subway. Another huge change is that he and Lydia are the best of friends, to the point where in the first episode they're going to celebrate their first friendship anniversary. Considering he was the primary antagonist in the film, and defeating him is what allowed the Maitlands and the Dietzes to live in peace and coexist with one another, this dynamic is definitely an interesting change to focus the entire series on. But the plot of the cartoon is this. Lydia and Beetlejuice are best buds. While he can pop into her world at any time, she can also travel with him to the netherworld using a little rhymey spell kind of thing. Though I'm unsure if the entire thing is needed or if it's just for a spooky kid dramatic flair, since it ends with the necessary saying of Beetlejuice's name three times anyhow. Though I know I should be wary, still I venture someplace scary. Ghostly haunting, I turn loose. Beetlejuice! 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 The Netherworld is also a totally different take on the afterlife than what we saw in the film. It's made up of all kinds of odd creatures and monsters, not just the spirits of the dead, and while it keeps a satirical view of the real world, it is far more based on social norms and consumerisms than a take that to bureaucracy. As mayor of this unfair town, I promise to raise taxes, abuse my power, and make your lives as miserable as possible. Reoccurring new characters are Beetlejuice's neighbors, Jacques Laline, a French skeleton who is somehow also a bodybuilder, Ginger, the tap dancing spider, who is, well, a spider who tap dances, and the monster across the street with his dog Poopsie. In each episode, Lydia and Beetlejuice have adventures, tackle some tough topics, learn some life lessons, and make learning about things like gothic literature fun. Something is rotten in Denmark. <laughs> No problem, it's me. Beetlejuice was voiced by Stephen Wimet, who was Pompadour on Babar, an archangel in the X-Men cartoon. Alison Court voiced Lydia, who was weirdly enough also in Babar, though as additional voices according to IMDb, and was Jubilee in the X-Men cartoons. So, you know, small world for 90s voice actors. She was also the voice of Claire Redfield in Resident Evil 2, Code Veronica, and pretty much every other Resident Evil game the character was featured in until the 2019 remake. Lydia was almost voiced by Tara Strong, who most folks know as the voice of Harley Quinn after Arlene Sorkin retired from the role. After recording the pilot, however, the pairing of Strong and Wimet just didn't quite work, so they redid the pilot with Court, which was a winning combo. Strong did end up voicing a few other characters in the show later on. Face it, I'm the only one with enough star quality to play Julia. That's Juliet. While a lot of the story and characters changed, one thing that did stay consistent between the two mediums was the music and visual style. Like I said before, Danny Elfman arranged the theme music, so every episode started with his signature carnival-esque strings and horns like the film. Also, like the movie, the cartoon was a mixed-medium project, but while the movie made use of stop-motion animation, the cartoon delved into the still pretty new concept of computer animation, giving us the delightfully strange and kind of disturbing commercials hosted by talking head Barry Minot. The afterlife getting you down? Feel like you're losing your marbles? 
losing touch with your real self? Then get in touch with your absolute existence and call Dr. Zygmunt Void, the loco hero and psycho scarapy. The Beetlejuice cartoon ran for four seasons, spanning the years 1989 to 1991 airing on both ABC Saturday Mornings and Fox Kids. It was actually one of the first animated shows to air on two unconnected networks simultaneously. New episodes were on ABC each week, and then were shown again on Fox. It also ran in syndication on Nickelodeon from 94 to 98, and sometime later on Cartoon Network. In 1990, it won an Emmy for Outstanding Animated Program, which it shared that year as a tie with Winnie the Pooh, and it's the first and only animation based off of a live-action film to have that honor. And of course, just like the movie, Nothing would ever be complete in the 80s or 90s without toys, trading cards, puzzles, lunchboxes, two video games, cheapo fast food kids meals junk, you name it, they made it. Except, weirdly enough, action figures. Kenner was in the process of developing an action figure line for the cartoon like they did the movie, but for some reason the deal ended up falling through. However, prototype sculpts do exist out there on the interwebs if you care to look. So yeah, there you have it, all things Beetlejuice. I still don't know why anyone decided that it was a perfect franchise for kids, but it definitely made our childhoods a bit more punny. I figured I'd end this by saying that my favorite episode of the Beetlejuice cartoon is a season four episode, Potpourri. In this episode, Beetlejuice is visited by the late, great Edgar Allan Poe, who is drowning in melancholy due to having lost his love, Lenore. As he wipes his tears and blows his nose on wads of cash, tossing the soiled bills away without a care, Beetlejuice decides that it's an excellent reason to keep Poe as sad as possible, so he can rake in all of that sweet, sweet emo goth cash. This whole plot point is a bit ironic considering, you know, Poe died destitute. Lydia decides to help Poe reunite with his love, while Beetlejuice has a series of nightmares referencing Poe's work, including the Telltale Heart, the Pit and the Pendulum, the Mask of the Red Death, and of course, the Raven. Who raps? Because it was the 90s. Raven came a-rappin', rap, rap, rappin'. Do you think you're ghostly as a ghost can get? Beetlejuice, my man, you ain't seen nothing yet. What was your favorite episode of Beetlejuice? Let me know in the comments below. And if you like this video and other weird strangeness, click subscribe. You can also check out our V-rated movie reviews and other oddities at neotrashvideo.net. Until next time, I'm Jenna from Neo Trash Video Saturday Morning Edition, and this was They Made a Cartoon Out of What? Da -bo -dee -bo -da.